You guys definitely coaxed me into this one. So this is the most requested style study in the history of style studies because this comes from not one, not two, but six different viewers over the last seven months. Today we're finally going to take a look at the work of Cokes Illust or Cokes underscore X if you know him on Instagram. So massive thank you to Nguyen Song, Arunima Santosh, Silas, Heart of Dark Light, Desika Chan and Miracle for requesting today's video. Don't mind me, I have my script here because there is no way I can remember six different names. But if you know why you're here, you can go ahead and skip to part one. The timestamps are in the video description. But if you're new here, hi, welcome. I hope you brought a snack because this is going to be a long one. Every final weekend of the month is Style Study in this house. Now, Style Study is a series on my channel where we take a look at some of our favorite contemporary artists, analyze their work and see what we can learn from it. We're not trying to copy anyone's style. We're just trying to learn from it and study it and see how we can apply it to our own work. I usually structure my style studies in three parts. In part one, we'll take a look at Coke's work, analyze his style, and see what we can learn from it. Part two will be a study of one of Coke's original paintings. The reference I've chosen today is this one. And in part three, we'll take everything that we learned today and apply it to a brand new original painting of our own. As always, if you enjoyed this video and find it helpful, then please do let me know by giving it a big thumbs up and leaving a comment below. Hit that subscribe button and notification bell so you don't miss a future upload on this channel. And if you'd like some more in-depth real-time tutorials every single week, come subscribe to my Patreon. The link is in the video description. But now grab a snack, sit back, and let's dive into another style study featuring Coke's Illust. Jong Hee Kim, better known by his screen name Coke's Illust, is a freelance artist from Seoul, Korea. For the purpose of this video, I'm gonna call him Coax, cause one, that's what you guys all know him as, and two, I'm 100% butchering his actual name, and as a fellow complicated name person, I know how annoying that is. So Coax often streams on Twitch, and based on Twitch highlights and his videos on YouTube, his personality just seems so wholesome and bubbly and super super nice. Coax's style, to me, seems like semi-realistic, fantasy illustration and if there is one word I could use to describe his art visually I'd say his art is dynamic. It is definitely fantasy art but not so high fantasy that it is completely unrealistic and this beautiful art has garnered him over 316,000 YouTube subscribers as well as over 34,000 followers on Twitch and over 27,000 on Instagram. Coax's art can be described as fantasy character illustrations, but somehow when you look at it, it feels realistic. Like you know there is no witch in this world that flies on a giant key holding stars in her hands, but when you look at the painting, it's like, well, duh, witches do that all the time. And it is like that with pretty much all of his paintings where logically you know that the elements in the composition aren't real, but somehow the way that he renders the scene makes you think that it just might be happening two streets down from you. It's a strange juxtaposition that when I first looked at it, I was like, well, obviously that's high fantasy. But then I scrolled past his Insta feed really quickly and it actually felt like I was skimming through a bunch of photos of real people. Now, obviously you can imagine how much of a challenge this was gonna be to dissect, but you know me, I love a good challenge when breaking down someone's art style. I guess in an alternate universe, I'd probably make for a good analyst. <laughs> Here are five key characteristics to Coax Illus art. So the first biggest aspect I want to talk to you about is about how Coates lights his scenes. I've always said this and I always will, but the lighting setup needs to be your first consideration when you start to render your painting. 
In his work, Cox generally sticks to a very simple single diffused key light that comes down from above the character, which leaves a diffuse glow on the upper half of the painting and creates soft shadows towards the lower half. It is a very effective way to create a flow in your composition without spending too long wondering how to direct the viewer's gaze. With this key light, however, one interesting feature is that it is super diffused on the skin, meaning there are pretty much no hard plane shifts. Only shadows you'll see on the face are drop shadows. Ambient occlusion is pretty much non-existent on the character's skin. Everything else around them, however, has solid shadows and ambient occlusion exactly where you'd expect it to be. So the hair, clothing, armor, background, all of it has visible, defined shadows that are placed accurately according to the lighting setup. A lot of the times though, Cox does place very faint secondary light sources around the character. However, there is a caveat to this. You might not notice it at first, but once you see it, you cannot unsee it. No matter how many secondary lights he uses or how intense they are, they do not significantly affect the skin. You might see a bit of rim light, but that's about as far as secondary lights go. Everything else in the scene could be affected by it, but just like with the shadows, the skin is pretty much untouched. And while you and I might do this at the early stages of our art studies and see it as a silly continuity error, the way Coax does this is actually very powerful because it creates a clear divide between the skin and the rest of the scene. The entire scene is rendered to be fairly realistic in that the materials interact with the light exactly as they should, but the skin, however, has a mind of its own and stays ethereal and unaffected. And that is where that cognitive dissonance sets in for you as a viewer, where you're clearly seeing a fantasy scene, but it still feels super realistic, as if it's happening in some part of the real world. It's because the vast majority of the elements in the scene are rendered to look realistic, but that perfect ethereal skin is where the effect takes a huge step away from realism and enters fantasy territory. Magic, huh? Let's take a deeper dive into the composition in Cox's paintings. The very first thing you'll notice almost the second you look at his work is that the character is pretty much always the center of focus. In fact, apart from a couple of paintings here and there, the character is usually in the literal center of the canvas, but there are a bunch of other ways in which Cox brings and keeps the attention on the character. He often paints the backgrounds to be relatively flat compared to the super detailed character. So in these character design pieces, for instance, the background is obviously obviously a flat black, white or grey, because the focus is on the character and how it's been devised to fit a brief, right? But even in full illustration pieces, you'll find that the background is super flat. And when I say flat, I don't just mean that it's low contrast. It often is, but when I say the background is flat, I mean there aren't very many midtones. This is something we keep coming back to in multiple style studies, and it just goes to show you how powerful this technique is that so many artists use it for their paintings, no matter what style they paint in. The more mid-tones you have in between the darkest and lightest tones in an object, the more blended out and three-dimensional it will look. So when you look at the character's skin, you see a lot of mid-tones, because it is all softly blended. With their clothes, however, it gets slightly flatter because you do have some areas of soft blending, but with the creases and the fabric and such, it's often just one highlight, one shadow, and a few mid-tones. But then you step into the background and see it's a whole other story, because now you're only seeing a couple of mid-tone values. Part of this is because the highlight and shadow tones don't vary too much, as in the brights aren't too bright and the darks aren't too dark, but you also don't have that soft blending in between that would make the background look as three-dimensional as the skin. And to take this another step further, Cox then goes in and often blurs the background, as well as other compositional elements that might lie in the mid-ground and foreground, so that the only thing that is perfectly in focus is the character. But like I said at the beginning of this video, if there was one word to describe Cox's work, it would be dynamic. 
and I found that the way he makes his compositions dynamic is through loads of long, fluid lines and curves, but more importantly, I couldn't find a single line in any of his paintings that goes perfectly vertical or perfectly horizontal. Everything is at an angle, no matter how subtle the angle might be. As you can guess, this is bound to make you feel very displaced and disoriented, because there is a tilt to every single element here. But if the entire scene is tilted, your brain is going to find that very hard to comprehend, because we live in a pretty static world as far as the ground and architecture is concerned, right? So subconsciously, the only conclusion your mind can come to is that the scene itself is probably steady, but it is you who is in motion. And to take this a step further, he'll sometimes add a motion blur, but only to the background, not to the character. This is another subtle compositional trick, because instead of making you think the character is still and the scene is in motion, your mind actually builds a complicated narrative where the scene is still and you and the character are in motion together. And that is a powerful storytelling element, because it forces you to subconsciously empathize with the character. When we move along with another person, it creates a strange bond between us, like with people who travel together, or when you dance with someone, soldiers who go to war together, or even just if you synchronize your breathing with someone else's breathing, it creates this connection between you and the other person because it feels like they are the only stable thing in your ever-changing world. And when Coax is forcing the character to be the only still element in the scene, he's able to create that kind of empathy between you and the character and that instantly gets you invested in the character's story because somehow it is now also your story. Okay, that was a little too deep. Let's come back to some of the surface level visual elements. When you look at the color palette Coax uses for any painting, it contains both warm and cool tones, but they are never in an even 50-50 split. In fact, there is usually a 3 is to 1 ratio between warm and cool tones in any order, so you'll have 3 quarters of the painting be warm toned and 1 quarter painted to be cool toned, or vice versa. And this is what dynamic lighting means in a practical sense. Any form of imbalance creates movement, that's just how our universe works. Whether you're trying to balance an egg on a spoon or your entire body on one foot, if there is imbalance, things are gonna move in order to create balance. So when Coax introduces that imbalance in between the warm and cool tones, the very nature of the imbalance creates a huge sense of movement in the painting. And yet it is not completely out of balance. He doesn't paint all of the painting warm or all of it cool, because even though theoretically that would be a huge imbalance between the warm and cool tones, within the painting itself, the other half of the color spectrum just wouldn't even exist, meaning that the painting is flat and hence stagnant. So you do want a bit of contrast where warm and cool tones coexist in your painting, because funnily enough, that adds balance and imbalance to your painting at the same time. Schrodinger is quaking. But one thing I need you to remember is that warm does not equal orange and cool does not equal blue. You can totally have a cool toned orange and you can have a warm toned blue because color temperatures are relative. Color temperature is a spectrum, so when you look at things like skin, for instance, you're gonna see warm and cool tones play off each other and create a contrast, but they would still just be different shades and tones of the same base color. So number three, make sure you have both warm and cool tones, but if you want to make the lighting dynamic, try and make sure that there isn't an even split between the two. When it comes to the characters themselves, Coax paints their features to be soft, but not overtly childlike. So the eyes are softened and rounded in the center, but they have pointy inner and outer corners, which bring age and movement to the face. Similarly, the nose bridge and nostrils are softly blended, but the tip of the nose ends in a point. And while the upper lip is fairly defined, the sides of the lower lip tend to blend into the skin. 
Again, we have this balance between the softer and sharper aspects of the facial features, and that creates a ton of movement within the face itself. But what struck me most of all was how much character he packs into each face that he paints. Pokes is a master at understanding facial expressions, not just the obvious loud ones, but also the subtle shifts that come with a more guarded face. And this is because he makes sure that the face is molded around the expression. A great contrast to this would be the work of Ross Tran, where even if his characters are smiling, the eyes remain unchanged by it. And that is obviously a stylistic choice to make the characters look unaffected by the world. But with Coax, every feature on the face shifts with the expression. So the smile isn't just in the mouth, it's also in the eyes, it's also in the cheeks and chin, and it is also in the nose. If the character is determined, you see it in the eyes, but also in how their jaw is set and how their mouth is pursed. If a character is suspicious, the eyebrows and mouth show it as much as the eyes do. He doesn't start with a neutral face and then tack on an expression. He starts with very expressive faces and that translates into every feature on the character, including the hair and the pose. In other words, regardless of how complex or simple the background may be, Coke's packs so much storytelling within the characters alone, you often don't even need to look for clues about the scene in the rest of the scene. This last one is super quick, but I just wanted to take a closer look at how Coax uses framing to direct your attention to the character's face without actually using lines and spotlights. Because when it comes to framing the character's face, his favorite weapon to use is rendering. Like we saw earlier on this list, the skin is very smoothly blended with loads of in-between mid-tone values, while the surrounding elements have fewer mid-tones, causing them to look less smoothed out. Well, to add to this, the surrounding elements also have very noticeable hard edges between the different values, which really cause them to be visually active zones. The skin, however, has very few hard edges, and even those are pretty low contrast, so they don't even register as hard edges. As a result, the skin appears to be a visually quieter zone. So when you look at the composition as a whole, you have a visually quiet area, which is surrounded on all sides by these loud, extremely detailed, noisy areas, and it almost creates this eye of the storm effect. And just like with an actual storm, you're gonna look for the safest place for your eyes to rest peacefully, and through no coincidence at all, that place just happens to be the character's face, which is what he intends to be the central focus of this painting. Neat idea there, Coax. I'm absolutely stealing that one, cheers. So to sum up part one, here are five key characteristics to Coax Illus art. Number one, the lighting is fairly simple, often using one diffuse key light from above the character, along with a few low intensity secondary lights that pretty much never affect the skin directly. Two, the character is always the focus of his painting, with the background rendered to be very flat and often blurry. Number three, Coax uses a 3 is to 1 ratio between warm and cool tones, or cool and warm tones in any order, but this creates a dynamic lighting that subtly creates a sense of movement at the very core of the painting. Number 4, the characters have soft features with some sharp angles thrown in there, so they look youthful but not entirely childlike. Every face has a ton of character, with expressions being the basis of what every feature in the face looks like. And number five, the face is very softly blended with low contrast, but it is surrounded by hard-edged, visually noisy elements, creating a framing effect that keeps you captivated on the character's face. So for the study today, here's the reference I've chosen. This is technically a cropped section of a larger painting, but it is detailed enough to make for a good study without being so detailed that it would take ages to study it properly. I think my biggest challenge when it came to this painting was getting the colors right in the hair. I don't know why, but it was such a huge struggle for me to find a blue that is dark enough to look deep and heavy, but not so dark that it blends right into the shadows. 
One thing I noticed about the skin, however, was the placement of the colors in her cheek. And looking back, this is also something you notice in most, if not all of his paintings. The most intense color in the cheek is actually placed quite high up, fairly close to the base of the eye. And further down on the face, the area of the jaw is quite pale and desaturated. Everything is super well blended, of course, and I ended up fighting a battle with the airbrush for way longer than I'm used to, but this pattern of placing the slightly deeper, more saturated tones up by the eyes and going pale and desaturated down towards the jaw was definitely new to me. I think it makes the jaw stand out as more defined and stronger, but it also gives the face a softer, more rounded appearance because you're not really seeing any shadows due to the cheekbones, Again, it is that juxtaposition of some sharp features being contrasted by other softer ones. Here's the final study I ended up with, and although it's not 100% identical, I think I managed to get pretty close. For the original painting this week, I wanted to do another Cosmic galaxy e painting. Because last week's one was so much fun, but this time I wanted to keep it fairly simple, focusing more on the face and skin, while keeping the background fairly blurry. I know at the beginning it looks like I spent ages on the background, but I do end up blurring it and lowering the amount of detail in it later on. For the character herself, I focused on keeping that one primary key light above her head and having a bunch of other lights that are there but don't affect how the shadows fall. In fact, I pretty much got rid of most shadows on her skin and the only hard edges you see on the skin are on the edge of every feature and under her jaw. Remember, we want softness with a hint of definition. And we definitely want the lightest bits at the jaw with the most value shifts and saturation sitting just under the eye. I've kept her hair very pale and I've been super in love with the holographic color palettes overall ever since the Celestial Fang style study, so I've tried to play that up in this painting in particular. This was definitely the most fun I've had painting a proper portrait in very long and I'm so glad we did this study because through this process I've realized just how much I miss painting faces. So here's this week's finished original painting. And there we have it, Coax Illus Demystified. Massive thank you to Nguyen Song, Arunima Santosh, Silas, Heart of Dark Light, Desika Chan, and Miracle for requesting this video. I hope you guys have enjoyed it and found it helpful. And if the rest of you have as well, then please do let me know by giving it a big thumbs up and leaving a comment below. Hit that subscribe button slash notification bell so you don't miss a future upload on this channel when it drops. And if there are any other artists you'd like to see style studies on, leave them in a comment below and I'll add them to my ever-growing list. Now you guys, this list is massive and it takes a while to get through them all because these videos take ages to make. Um, so please be patient with me. Thank you for being patient with me. Um, but I will get to your artists at some point. <laughs>
Again, if you'd like to support this channel and grab even more exclusive content every single week, then check out my Patreon. The link is in the video description as well as on the screen at some point soon. Um, but with that said, thank you so, so much for hanging out with me today. I hope it's been as much fun for you as it has for me. I'll put all the cell studies in a playlist in the outro, so check that out if you haven't already. And I'll see you guys on the next one. Bye!